Welcome, dear colleagues, to the eighth webinar, Impact Outcomes-Based Learning, um, supported by Medtronic. And uh, today, we will have two lectures, starting with Felix Eigner, then followed by Walter Brunner, and by Michael presenting an interesting case. So good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for the invitation by Andreas, and thanks to Medtronic to invite me to this uh, quite uh, distinct um, webinar on advanced colorectal surgery. I have the privilege to talk about D3 lymph node uh, removal in colonic cancer. And I think it's a highly debated uh, topic in colorectal surgery these days. And I hope to somehow bring light into that complex discussion by presenting evidence, uh, which is uh, still scarce and ongoing research on that. Here are my conflicts of interest, and this is my agenda. I want to define the D3 uh, lymph node um, classification somehow and point to the rationale for D3 lymph node dissection and uh, um, want to build a bridge to the CME, the complete mesocolic excision philosophy, and uh, close up with the evidence from the literature and uh, probably can uh, transfer our um, efforts in the German society to standardize the laparoscopic uh, approach to the uh, right hemicolectomy. I want to show you some videos on that with anatomical considerations. So um, when talking about colonic lymphatic tissue, we should not refer to apples and pears in this uh, discussion, but strictly relate uh, to one and the same classification to prevent any kind of confusion which might appear. And we should stick to the Japanese classification system with the D1, the paracolic, the D2, the intermediate, and the D3, the central lymph node stations. And in our case, in the right hemicolon, the 203 and the 2013 station uh, along the super mesentric vessels are decisive as well as, as the 223 station for the extended right or left hemicolectomy along the middle colic vessels. And on the left side, the 253 station along the root of the inferior mesentric uh, artery are uh, important uh, for the D3 stations. Here again, a schematic illustration from the uh, uh, publication of Kataoka and co-workers uh, recently uh, published uh, with the three lymph node uh, uh, stations, the central lymph nodes, also L3, classified the intermediate and the paracolic lymph nodes. And uh, now that our Western pathologists report only the number of retrieved and invaded nodes, not their anatomical location, the question uh, can be justified, should we rather focus on the anatomical uh, distribution pattern, uh, thus adopt the Japanese classification, or uh, is it not necessary to um, uh, particularly uh, differentiate between the different uh, lymph node uh, stations? So, um, in the absence of randomized controlled trials, um, let's have a look at the distribution pattern at all. And uh, this uh, Japanese class, uh, publication clearly shows that if uh, the different lymph node stations I've shown you uh, are affected, different combinations of invaded lymph nodes uh, might occur. And I just want to uh, draw your attention to the case that if the central lymph nodes are invaded, it is possible in 16% of the cases that only those lymph nodes can be infiltrated, or even those lymph nodes and the uh, uh, intermediate lymph nodes, uh, summarizing over 20% of the central lymph nodes being invaded. So this might justify the D3 lymph node retrieval at all. 
This has been also um, confirmed by others shown on the left top uh, of this slide. Nearly uh, in the review by Klaus Bertelsen, 20% uh, of the central lymph nodes were uh, infiltrated. But take attention, this is not only referring to the right hemicolon, but to all sides of the colon, also to the left hemicolon. So we should differentiate a little bit uh, when reading those papers. So, but does it really make sense to differentiate and to uh, tell our pathologists they should mark the invaded lymph nodes? Uh, also from this Japanese uh, publication, uh, the oncological outcome, uh, namely the recurrence free survival and the overall survival does not, are not affected by the tumor location nor by the invasion of the different uh, lymph node stations. But as we all know by the T stage, so the local staging and the lymph node ratio as well as the pathologic lymphatic invasion. That is the reason why we uh, uh, rather draw our attention to the number of invaded lymph nodes than to the location of themselves. But it's not only a matter of counting lymph nodes or um, differentiating the location of the lymph nodes. But also um, to stick to the philosophy of this uh, gentleman, Professor Werner Hohenberger from Erlangen, who uh, introduced uh, the technique or the uh, approach of the complete mesocolic excision, drawn from the very, very good results of the uh, total mesorectal excision of rectal cancer. So when talking about D3 lymph node um, retrieval, we also have to uh, think about the complete mesocolic excision. And this goes one uh, in, in, in one course. So what is CME? CME is a complete preservation of the visceral fascia, of the uh, peritoneal um, uh, coverage of uh, the um, duplication structures. Second, it is the dissection of lymph nodes around the mesenteric artery root. You cannot divide a D3 or central lymph node dissection from the CME. This belongs to each other. And third, it goes around, uh, along with the high ligation of the central feeding vessels. And that's very important. Is it clear for everybody or is it clear for every location of the colonic cancer surgery? No. Even though this is a very old uh, publication by Nick West, but highlights that from left to right colon, um, the rate of really, really uh, bad dissection, namely the dissection along the muscularis propria, which should be avoided in any case, um, increases from left to right. So obviously the right and especially the transverse colon um, is uh, affected by this uh, negative oncologic outcome as due to the negative or due to the, to the deteriorated dissection um, of the colon. So we should in any case, in any case um, avoid such bad dissections along the muscularis propria and stick to the CME, which can be inversely shown in the right light blue graph. So let's go to the rationale for D3 dissection. Um, so the dissection along the right um, embryologic layer, namely the mesocolic uh, excision at all, uh, can be highlighted in the same publication by Nick West that it really matters regarding the overall survival, not in the, uh, in the, in the stage one colonic cancer, uh, but in stage two and stage three. And overall, uh, this can be uh, clearly highlighted in those uh, graphs. On the other hand, the 10 centimeter rule to uh, resect, resect all the colon uh, which is affected uh, in a distance uh, of 10 centimeter from the tumor site should be respected uh, by ligating uh, or centrally ligating the, uh, the feeding vessels. Uh, in this case of an ascending colon carcinoma, it's the ileocolic and the right colic uh, branches 
which should be removed in the classical approach of uh, right hemicolectomy. And those facts, uh, together with the fact that the mesocolic fascia should be preserved, because we know from anatomical studies uh, like uh, this from Culligan and uh, co-workers a few years ago, that lymph, uh, lymphatic uh, tracts are right uh, along the mesocolic fascia. And uh, by uh, dissecting or uh, breaking those fascias, uh, lymphatic uh, vessels are uh, injured and uh, tumor cell spillage uh, is uh, uh, very obvious. So with all, those, um, with all those facts, we should stick and should uh, confirm that we are doing a CME uh, in any of our colonic cancer cases. And I thank Alexei Petrov uh, for his presentation at the, this year's uh, ESCP, um, um, comparing the CME procedure with a cappuccino. You would not ever order a cappuccino without milk. This is to be questioned. And that is the same thing with the CME. You won't do a, col a complete mesocolic excision without performing a D3 dissection, would you? So take this into attention. But we should teach our teachers. This is a, a publication or a graph from a, a, a very recent uh, textbook uh, where a right hemicolectomy is uh, uh, illustrated like this. And as you can see, all the uh, central uh, feeding arteries and vessels are not ligated at their root, which does not uh, uh, go along with the principles of CME at all. So, what is the evidence? If you have a look at the, if you have a look at this graph here, uh, very busy. I'm sorry, but uh, if you concentrate on the um, on the uh, German data, of, on the Erlangen data of uh, Werner Hohenberger. The first uh, cases which were operated with respect to the CME and the others are uh, operated um, uh, following a non-CME approach. And you can see uh, that there is a significant difference, especially in the uh, UICC stage three regarding uh, local recurrence rate, overall survival, and uh, disease-specific survival uh, between the CME and the non-CME group, pointing to the fact that the oncological outcome is better in the CME-operated uh, uh, patients. Uh, whereas in this uh, review, uh, right and left colonic cases were um, uh, included. So this has to be considered when uh, analyzing uh, those data. Um, a recent uh, meta-analysis by Wang and co-workers uh, showed um, or analyzed uh, the outcome, uh, the, uh, the, the surgical outcome, the quality of CME and the oncological outcome uh, in a huge series of patients uh, feeding uh, this meta-analysis. And they came to the point that uh, there is limited evidence which suggests that CME is a more effective strategy indeed for improving specimen quality and survival, but with a higher complication rate. So what about randomized control trials? Because uh, in those meta-analysis, only a few randomized control or, or uh, uh, randomized control trials were included. So there is only scarce data. And as you can see, many of those or majority of those uh, trials uh, uh, are still recruiting and the results are pending. But as you can see, most of the trials uh, derive from uh, Chinese um, uh, work groups and they compare, for example, in this first trial, lab CME versus lab uh, D3. And I uh, question again with the cappuccino philosophy, what is the difference between CME and D3? So uh, I think this should be, uh, perhaps it's a provocative question, but this should be uh, really highlighted when uh, discussing the results of those, uh, uh, of those studies. Indeed, the results uh, already uh, 
driven from the from this study is uh, that there is nearly no difference in the uh, uh, account or count of lymph nodes yielded uh, in lab CMEA or lab D3. So the other studies are still pending, but the cold trial there are already results um, uh, in the in the short run. Uh, also, as a Russian study, also uh, run by the group around Petrov, which I already uh, mentioned, they combined D2 versus D3, but for all colonic sites uh, and laparoscopically as well as in an open approach. So the primary outcome is five year overall survival, where the results are still uh, missing, as you can imagine, but uh, the secondary outcome with the uh, pathological results show that there are a significant more um, uh, positive lymph nodes harvested in the D3 than in the D2 group, which goes along with the slide I showed you in the beginning of the Japanese classification system that there are also lymph nodes in the central station, which uh, uh, are invaded in nearly 20% of the cases. So this is probably the study which uh, 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 caused a paradigm shift uh, when doing or uh, laparoscopic or when doing CME at all with a D3 lymph node dissection. This is the uh, Pertelsen study from 2019, um, analyzing patients with stages uh, 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 one to three colonic cancer with the primary outcome of the uh, incidence of recurrence and mortality after five years of surgery. And the results are by doing complete mesocolic excision, um, uh, the uh, overall survival uh, improves significantly, especially in the, uh, uh, in the later era of this study when overcoming the learning curve as shown in the bottom of this graph. The rate of lephroscopy in, in Bertelsen's uh, series was 60% uh, uh, in the CME and 33 in the non-CME group. So when uh, regarding the uh, cumulative incidence of recurrence and survival, there are indeed significant differences in both of the eras before and after having um, overcome the learning curve as shown in this graph, where you can see a significant risk reduction uh, regarding the local recurrence rate uh, in both era. Um, in all of the stages uh, of the colonic cancer, not only in the uh, two and three stages, but also in UICC stage one, which is very, very impressive. And have a look where the local recurrence rate could be reduced 70% uh, from 35 to 70% between the non-CME and the CME group. Points to the fact that CME should be really fostered in those cases of colonic cancer. What about the bowel function? Because I uh, mentioned that uh, the uh, complication rate is quite higher in the CME group than in the non-CME group. Bowel function uh, uh, in this study where D2 and D3 dissection is compared in the right hemicolon, uh, the D3 extended mesenterectomy leads to an increased bowel frequency but does not impact gastrointestinal quality of life, which I think is a really important matter we have to discuss with our patients when we plan such an extended lymph node uh, uh, resection. What about the left hemicolon? Is there a difference in the functional outcome? Uh, there is no difference in the lymph node count and the functional outcome, there is also no difference when doing uh, a CME uh, uh, or a uh, SRA non-preserving uh, uh, D3 lymph node dissection. This leads to the same discussion about high and low tie um, ligation of the IMIA uh, in the left hemicolon as well as in the rectal cancer uh, surgery. So no significant difference in bowel function also on the left side. Leads me to the last point of my agenda what about laparoscopic uh, standardization of uh, CME with D3 lymph node removal? And in a German working uh, group um, around uh, Christoph uh, Strey and uh, Stefan uh, Benz, Christoph Wuhlstein, um, uh, we have um, established a 
step-by-step -step procedure with critical views uh, where to, um, you know, to, to guarantee a safe implementation of this laparoscopic hemicolectomy on the right side. And as I could um, consider in your answers of one of the questions, uh, nearly uh, half of your uh, of, of you uh, perform or 60% uh, indeed uh, of you perform this procedure laparoscopically. So we developed the open book um, uh, model, as you might uh, know from Stefan Benz and his uh, presentations, and I'm uh, proud to uh, may show his slides here. I just want uh, uh, to, to, to skip the slides a little bit in a fast uh, fashion because we are running off time. So the issue is to um, divide this very complicated um, operation or technical uh, challenging uh, operation of a laparoscopic right hemicolectomy uh, into different steps with critical views, which should be documented um, by the operating surgeon and uh, a study is still uh, running and recruiting patients for this uh, for the standardization of this technique. But first, uh, critical view is uh, 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 the, the 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 demonstration of the inferior part of the duodenum, and I uh, you can uh, reach this view uh, in a, a steep uh, Trent Ellenberg and uh, right uh, 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 turning of the patient. And uh, you go in, like you can see here, by uh, pushing the small bowel to the right uh, upper abdomen and then going uh, right to the trites flexure, opening uh, the peritoneum and the mesocolic uh, fascia to enter the room between the tolls fascia and the garota fascia, and which can be shown in this video uh, quite nicely. Here's the uh, inferior part of the duodenum um, this is Gerota fascia, this is Toad's fascia, and uh, by doing a, a, a partial uh, Kocher maneuver, we lift the inferior part of the duodenum, now showing, and this can be easily uh, demonstrated here, the Toad's fascia, which is then incised, entering the uh, space of Freide, just uh, above the duodenum. I will jump a little bit for. You can see it here when we open this space by dissecting the Tolts fascia. Tolts fascia should be on top of the specimen just to guarantee oncological radicality. Then entering the space of Freyde just above the inferior part of the duodenum and the pancreatic head shown here. Here's the pancreatic head. This is the space of Freyde opened up with the Toad's fascia here and the mesocolon here, there, and the uh, duodenum uh, at the bottom. Then we go on. This is the uh, definitive specimen with the Toad's fascia shown here in a pretty fashion. But let's go back to the critical views. Number two, we uh, use the, the mesocolic uh, fascias like a, a book, like the pages of a book, and we uh, just turn the last page and then look uh, from uh, the anterior aspect and uh, there is the iliocolic um, vessel or the iliocolic axis here and the superior mesenteric vein there. This is the V view between those two uh, vascular structures and we enter the space uh, dissected before um, just by uh, dissecting or just by incising the peritoneum here, medial to the ileocolic uh, vessels. Uh, critical view number three is the demonstration of uh, the uh, ileocolic artery. And you see the superior mesenteric vein and the superior mesenteric artery uh, behind are dissected. And the anterior aspect, this guarantees a complete dissection of these uh, lymph node uh, stations uh, 203 and 2. One three, along with the surgical trunk here. Critical view number four is the dissection. Uh, three was the dissection of the ileocolic vein, and four is the ileocolic artery. After having ligated those uh, vessels uh, at their root, we turn the next page of our book and uh, open up the lesser sac view. 
by incising the gastrocolic ligament to get an access to the lesser sac. Here, the stomach from the posterior aspect, the pancreas, and this is the lesser sac view. The sixth view is the sulcus view, the sulcus uh, between, here's the lesser sac opened, here is the gastroepiploic arcade uh, and uh, the middle colic vessels uh, there and uh, uh, a, rid, a rim appears which should be dissected because uh, in a right uh, hemicolectomy, in a conventional right hemicolectomy, the gastroepiploic lymph nodes and uh, uh, tissue can be preserved as we all know. The critical view number seven for the conventional right hemicolectomy is demonstration of the right branch of the middle colic artery, which uh, uh, can be uh, uh, separately demonstrated here, uh, clipped, and then the central vessel ligation is fulfilled uh, following the principles of uh, CME. The critical view number eight is the Hainle trunk, which can be shown here with its uh, uh, tributaries here, the superior uh, right colonic vein, which is clipped, of course, but the Hainle trunk itself must be preserved. And this is important just to reduce the complication rate. These are the specimens and they can be uh, retrieved in an open as well as laparoscopic, but also in a robotic approach. So this is important that uh, CME can be uh, guaranteed in all those techniques. Unfortunately, uh, going back to this uh, um, uh, 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 study by Stefan Benz showing that uh, uh, the resection study that this beautiful CME type zero with the complete surgical trunk, this is only in this study is a retrospective analysis, uh, but of uh, over 1,300 uh, specimens uh, only 40% uh, uh, of those specimens were really, really beautiful type zero uh, complete CME specimens. So we have to work on it and uh, lab standardization is on the way. So my last slide or one of my last slides, what about uh, laparoscopic versus open colonic surgery? We've already shown this in the framework of this module of Medtronic uh, uh, webinars. Uh, early on. And, and as you can see, these are data from uh, the German registry. So the numbers of uh, laparoscopic colonic surgery are still raising thanks to the standardization of working groups like this uh, around uh, Stefan Benz. And when, when you compare uh, laparoscopic with open colonic surgery, we can see that there is, uh, uh, that, uh, there is a non-inferiority of the laparoscopic uh, uh, colonic uh, surgery, especially in extended um, uh, colonic cancer as shown by this nice review uh, from the Regensburg uh, group uh, regarding overall mortality risk, uh, overall survival, uh, local and distant metastasis and uh, five-year disease-free survival. So we have to face that laparoscopic colonic surgery in uh, uh, extended and advanced colonic cancer is a well-established and oncologically uh, justified uh, procedure. This is also mentioned by meta-analysis by Negoy and co-workers uh, pointing to the fact that it is superior in all perioperative results and at least non-inferior in long-term oncological results. So let me summarize. The complete mesocolic excision is with the words of uh, Alexei Petrov, a cappuccino. You cannot divide uh, the complete mesocolic excision from a D3 lymph node dissection. This goes uh, along. Uh, the procedure is laparoscopically feasible, but it needs standardization. That is the reason why we uh, plan proctorships uh, in Germany and in Austria, why the European Society of Coloproctology offers uh, uh, training courses as well um, as uh, um, proctorship uh, programs for uh, this technically challenging but feasible uh, technique of laparoscopic uh, CME. CME brings an oncological benefit in the long run, approximately 10% as shown uh, by uh, the registries, especially by the Erlangen uh, data, even though 
uh, uh, not uh, divided into uh, right and left uh, colonic cases. The morbidity and the functional outcome are not worse in the uh, extended uh, lymph node retrieval. CME means complex surgery, but uh, by knowing the anatomy, this very complex anatomy, as I showed you in the videos, uh, it makes sense. And uh, I can only uh, uh, propose and, and, and suggest you uh, following anatomical skills labs before starting the program uh, of uh, a laparoscopic, um, uh, a laparoscopic CME program. So started with proctoring and uh, there are, uh, or there is the, uh, uh, the, the European Society of Coloproctology, which offers CME training. Uh, you can uh, uh, have a look at the, at the website and uh, choose uh, one of those training programs uh, if uh, it is uh, uh, available after the corona pandem pandemic. So we know this is difficult in these days to uh, jump around and uh, uh, travel and uh, visit other centers, but I'm sure that it will become true in the near future. So thank you very much for the attention. I'm very, very looking forward to discuss this uh, hot topic with you. Now it's my pleasure to welcome Walter Brunner, to give his lecture on the combination of T4 tumors and CME and uh, laparoscopic surgery in, in Walter, please, your presentation. Okay. Hello, everybody. So you heard a lot already on the D3 and also on the right side and the left side in our webinar series. And now we talk about the T4 tumors in laparoscopic colorectal surgery. Actually, um, I will more talk about the, the colon than on the rectum because there will be an own session on, on APR and intersphincteric resection. So you, you will see this anyway. Um, but what we know is the highest impact on prognosis of colon cancer, of course, on the one hand um, is the tumor characteristics uh, stage at the site also, but it's also, of course, the surgeon and the treatment which is provided for the patient. So if we look on which tumors we are talking now, it is uh, the T4 and T4A and B. You see the wall of the bowel. And as soon as it invades some structures uh, outside of the bowel or to the visceral peritoneum, it's called a T4 uh, tumor. And of course, many, many countries and in the beginning, it was somehow like forbidden to do T4 tumors in the laparoscopic way. And there are some reasons you really should consider to do that. Uh, nevertheless, let's have a look which stages are there. There is the T4A and B without lymph nodes, which means a 2B or 2C, depending on A or B T4 stadium. Then there is the 3B and 3C stage if you have lymph node metastasis, uh, depending on how many of the lymph nodes are involved. If it's more than seven, it's a TN2B already. And of course, if you have metastasis, it's a stage four, and that's uh, T4 tumors are, of course, uh, if they have metastasis, uh, in a very worse prognosis. And you can also see that the, they are uh, in these three groups of the stages. Um, and you always have to expect something unexpected if you go in. So for example, on the left side, you see there were small, very uh, uh, superficial metastases. So if you do your first uh, few around in, in laparoscopy, uh, don't only focus on the tumor, but also focus like on the left side very small uh, carcinoma in the peritoneum. And that maybe changes, of course, your strategy during the operation. So you also have to inform the patient before that you will have a look around. And if something happens, maybe you, uh, you, you change your strategy. Even in, in times like this, when we have a lot of good and fancy diagnostic in advance, it can be that uh, you miss especially uh, um, peritoneal carcinosis below five millimeters will not be seen on the CT scan. We know that the survival rates go down and the higher the stage is, you see it's from around 10% in stadium four and stage four after five years, but it should be over 95% in stage one. 
and that the T4 tumors are only in stage two, three, and four. And it really depends if you have lymph nodes involved or if you have metastasis, what the survival is. Um, today, the diagno if you're diagnosed today with a colon cancer, you have a little bit more improved outcomes than this is written here. This was published in 2004. It's similar in 2015. And maybe now we have more uh, options of therapies and also more precise preoperative diagnostics. So it's a little bit better, mainly in, in two and four, and also the chemotherapy is better. So it's not only the surgery helping a lot. It's also dependent on the histological subtype. We know that you see, for example, that the signet cell carcinomas are always worse beside the stage one, but the T4 tumors are only in two, three, and four, as we said. And it's also a little bit from the tumor localization um, that, that the right side seems to be a little bit worse than the left side, but there are also publications showing, especially in a propensity score matching that this is not true. So uh, the most, most of the publications show that the right side have a little worse uh, outcome than the left side. Um, on the other hand, there is also, and in times of Corona, I think this is important to point out, if you have a delay to surgery, um, then uh, that makes also a, a big step in survival. And there was a nice publication this year looking on primary elective surgery. Um, and you see if you delayed, you, you made a, a short delay in within the first seven, 16 days. So overall survival over all stages were 75% and after 10 years, 56. But if you delayed the operation more than 37 days after the diagnosis, this dropped down and both was significant after five and after 10 years. So we really have to imagine if we are not able to, to do the proper surgery, which could be possible, then outcome is also worse if we delay more than 37 days. They said it's especially it's, it's, it's increasing um, and uh, beyond 40 days, it's completely clear that you have uh, worse uh, prognosis. So the question is, should we do T4 colon cancer in a laparoscopic manner or what are we doing to our patients if we just let them slide down um, and it's not fancy for us but we really have to think to do the best option for the patient that's the main goal so the question is where is the infiltration in a t4 tumor and there can be different locations of course it can be from the abdominal wall which is completely different than if you have the ureter or the kidney the gallbladder liver stomach if you have the pancreas for example the small bowel which maybe could be easy if it's the vessels, it's much more difficult. If it's the vagina or the prostate, it's more going towards rectal cancer, which could be possible to make an accentuation, for example, or the uterus, also the bladder. Um, but if, as it's other structures, it could be quite, quite difficult to make that on block because this is the most important thing that we are able to make an on block resection. Never try to divide the organs which are together if it's not clear that they are not involved. The second question is, Will you be able to do a proper surgery like shown by, by Felix before uh, that, that you should make the same thing? So the specimen should look in the end of the operation, as I told you in many webinars already, it should look in the end the same as in the beginning. So you very nicely have all your lymph nodes and all your vessels you want to have and you don't damage uh, the uh, CME layers or the TME layers in rectal cancer. And sometimes you have to be aware that in four T4 tumors, also the lymph nodes are much more stick to the vessels and it's much more complicated to even if you would be able to approach the vessels, there are some lymph nodes in your way that make it very difficult to make a proper laparoscopic dissection of the vessels. So these are mainly the, the, the disadvantages if you come from the laparoscopic way or the, the, the most challenging thing uh, things you have to face. I give you one example. This is a CT where we see the tumor which is infiltrating the abdominal wall and they can go into the video. You see there is a small bowel which really is not, it's only a little bit attached but there will be uh, nothing else and you saw it on the, on the CT scan. It's only going into the abdominal wall. As I showed you, I like to come from below but then also try to find the planes which are not involved. And then, of course, we have to resect the, the part uh, additionally, which now you see the muscle of the abdominal wall already. We have to resect complete uh, together with everything. This was nicely shown like before. It was a right side tumor shown by Felix, so I can skip that. I want to divide the small bowel before 
I run up, I do the same CME as it was shown before. So you, you should uh, have the, the same oncological result in the end. The vein should be free. You should divide the, the other is very safe. If you are lucky, there are no lymph nodes, like in this case, close to the, to the vessel. So you can easily do that. Um, I divide both sides always, especially in malignancy. And you see, in the end, it was just cutting through the muscle outside. So in the abdominal wall, maybe it could be easy. You just have to think about the hernia. Um, and I would recommend all the malignant put in a bag, all the malignant tumors always put in a bag to have the specimen in the end look quite nice. And as I told you, we measure it immediately. So this is one example where you can do a T4 tumor. There is another example where we have a transverse colon cancer. And you see, this is a huge cancer and it's infiltrating the, the, the stomach. And of course you can consider to make just a wedge resection of the stomach. And this would be pretty nice possible. But unfortunately, this patient also had a infiltration towards the pancreas. So we did not dare to go there and maybe harm the pancreas or in, 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 in case we had to resect the, the pancreas. And this is not a good case to start that uh, for laparoscopy. So it was more a diagnostic procedure to have an overview and maybe a little bit of flexion mobilization on both sides. But the central part we made my a laparotomy to be sure to get rid of the pancreas and also uh, of the vessels. Because this is important that in the end you have your vessels fine prepared and, and not the, the tumor uh, infiltrating the vessel and you run in a big problem, you maybe win, will not be able to manage laparoscopic. So it's better to do that then open. I remember you, I remind you on the surgical anatomy, this is a picture where maybe Felix showed you already the mid gut and the hind gut supply. And I, I told you already where you best find the plane, uh, you could open at the promontory at the inferior mesenteric vein or laterally, which is very nice for the left side. And if you have a tumor, which is not close to one of these positions, always start far away from the tumor, which is infiltrating maybe one of the uh, planes there and, and start from one of the sides, which is possible. And the same is for the, for the right side. Ideal sickle is good at the superior mesenteric vein is an option as you saw before by, by the, the pictures of bands which Felix Eigner showed you, and from the lateral side. So if possible, don't start at the tumor. It should always be possible. And first find a nice plane where you can uh, do a proper plane dissection. So what, what I always uh, say is maybe the lymph nodes are, are more, more difficult. You see, this is a, a left side tumor, and we estimate already that there will be uh, big uh, lymph nodes around the, the aorta, especially at the uh, mesenteric artery. So you see, we can easily start at the promontory. We can find the plane. Now we run up the, the aorta uh, and we expect already that maybe there the planes will not be that easy, but we do that to the lateral side. You see the, the iliac artery and then you see the lymph nodes already around. It's close up to the duodenum where we see the lymph nodes uh, close to the uh, mesenteric artery. So it can be difficult. And of course you should not go into the aorta if possible, we should avoid to damage uh, the nerves, but nevertheless, if we are able to resect uh, all the lymph nodes, uh, even if we are very close to the aorta, you see that for the moment, uh, then it's a good idea. If we are not able, we, we should try to do it open. And if this is also not possible, so maybe you leave some of them behind and then it's only palliative and they need chemotherapy anyway. You see, we leave some of the, of the lymph nodes behind because we saw that we first have to cut the artery. And after we divided the artery, which actually um, I did a lot of those with the, with the sealing instrument. If you do it proper, it's possible. Of course, you can staple or clip. And then we took the other lymph nodes, paraortic, uh, to, to make like a tumor debulking. And, and we really were, uh, could remove all those lymph nodes, which we saw on the, on the CT. And of course we made a, a PET CT also to see if there was something like distant metastasis, otherwise major surgery maybe would not have made sense and a stoma would be enough. Uh, here it's the same, it, it, it was a woman. Um, we divided on both sides, we put it in a bag and this is a chance, if, especially if the tumor is a little larger to avoid big incisions, you can think about where you retrieve the specimen. You see, we put it um, in, into a bag, all the malignant 
uh, colon tumors we put in the bag. And this is one of the options to do it transvaginally to make the extraction uh, because of the huge tumor. So you, you can avoid making a big incision. This was a T4A, a 2B stadium of with 14 of 31. And it was an air zero resection, which is the most important. Of course, they will have chemotherapy afterward. Now, if we look in the, in the literature on T4 colon cancer with laparoscopy, actually in most of the randomized controls studies, typically T4 is excluded. So there are only case series. But I want to point out there is a significance of air one resection margin in colon cancer resections, um, which uh, makes a big difference in, in recurrence and also in, uh, as you see, overall and disease-free survival so we want to avoid it and the air one rate is 13 percent which is which is rather high and this is a publication uh, which is not that old it's five years old so you see the the resection rate is rather high and in which uh, of course this is in, in the in the difficult ones and this is if you have a perforation then there is the t4 tumors those who are poor differentiated which are lymph node positive and have a lot of positive lymph nodes and if they have vascular infiltration. So you see the T4 tumors are in the group which have a very high R1 uh, 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 resection rate. And this is what we really try to avoid. So the unblock resection with a good distance to both organs is really crucial. And if you, if you cannot do that laparoscopic beta, go for open surgery. Another thing is you see um, that also these R1 resections in the tumor state is, is mainly in the T4 uh, a and B, and it's a little bit more even in, in the T4A, uh, the vascular invasion and the lymph node status, as I showed you. So this is what we want to avoid. And another thing is the radial margin positivity. So not only the, the R1 resection, but also if the tumor is already in the non serialized portion of the colon, this also um, gives uh, um, a, a problem looking on overall and disease-free, especially survival. You see if the radial margin status is involved, then uh, the outcome is worse. So there we have no chance. So if the, there is a, a portion of the colon, uh, which is non serialized uh, already involved. So this has nothing to do with our resection, but nevertheless, you have to be aware that this could be an earlier recurrence that this could be uh, peritoneal carcinosis. So if you have a patient like this, you should a little bit uh, think forward how, how to treat him and how to close you make your controls. Uh, overall, the, the rate is around 5.3%. So there are patients uh, we have with, within that uh, stadium. And mainly, of course, it's uh, stadium T3 and 4, and even T4 is more. And if they're lymph node positive, the risk is also higher to have a positive radial margin. So if, if in, in the end, the, the pathologist chose this, think a lot um, uh, about your strategy, how to control them. You see, they were also done laparoscopic uh, surgery in this group already, and the conversion rate is around 13, but up to 50%, especially this is a small group uh, of, of patients uh, with a radial margin positivity, which had laparoscopy, but nevertheless, there also the conversion rate was much higher, maybe for strategic, and that's okay if you do strategic uh, uh, conversion to open and not reactive if you already uh, made an R1 resection. And also these patients, of course, had a higher proportion of multivisceral resection because they were T4 tumors uh, infiltrating another organ. So this is relevant and, and if possible, uh, you should predict it and, and think about how to assess them later on. So the oncological outcomes following laparoscopic versus open in a T4, this was published in 2017. Um, normally it's considered, as I told you, that the locally advanced colon cancer is a relative contraindication, but you can do that. And you see that there are uh, some 3000 in, in studies in, in the year 2017, uh, they had around 50 to 70 in the highest number, but uh, and there's one group who had 400 50 laparoscopic uh, resections in the locally advanced uh, group. Uh, and you see that the conversion rate was a little bit higher than today expected. So about 15 to 18% we, we estimate. Uh, of course, in colon cancer, normally we are, we are below 5% in the conversion rate. But you see 
uh, of course, in these advanced, it's higher. And it including also the strategic conversion, as I told you. So you should always be prepared. Laparotomy could be required just for the unblock resection before you harm anything. And then you see that there is no difference. If you can proper do that, that's also from 2017, that the survival rate between open and laparoscopy is the same. So you, if you are advanced in laparoscopic surgery and especially in laparoscopic colorectal surgery, you can consider to do it or to start in a laparoscopic way. This was published in 2018. Also, this, they, they show that radial resection margin positivity was very low and the conversion rate here in this group is about uh, 4%. The five year and the uh, disease free and overall survival is also very good for a T4 colon cancer. Of course, this will mainly be T4N0. So it really depends on the stage and it will not be the stage four uh, with that high uh, rate. So if you look on the guidelines and we compare a little bit between Western and Asian guidelines, um, mainly um, it's the same that for the moment, there is no locally advanced disease uh, or, or local advanced uh, complications which are expected is not minimal invasive uh, surgery is not recommended. But as we know, this a guideline is done about five to 10 years after the publications are good enough to make a guideline out of that. So it, it's, it's no wonder that in the guidelines it's written, you should not do it. But if you're very experienced, as I said, there is an option. And also you should be aware of the metastatic cancer and peritoneal disease and then HIPEC and PIPEC and the second look uh, should be considered. And just to, to put that on the way, um, we know that it's up to 30% in T4 colon cancer, you have already. Uh, peritoneal carcinosis, the CT detection rate is rather good, but not if the lesions are very small, as I showed in the video before, it's less than 30%, you find lesions below five millimeters and more to uh, indirect signs. So therefore often the detected uh, late when only 20 to 25% can be treated with a, a high pack uh, because the, if the PCI, so the peritoneal carcinosis index is higher than 12, uh, the, 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 it, it makes no sense to make major surgery. So if it's below than six, it's, it's very good. And if it's over 16, even then uh, you, you should avoid major surgery. What about hyperthermic uh, intraperitoneal chemotherapy? Uh, if you, you find them in, in T4, and there's a nice uh, publication from the, the Dutch group in 2019, and they showed that uh, they made a high pack five to eight weeks after resection of the primary tumor, already 9% had uh, peritoneal carcinosis already um, when they made this uh, from 2015 to 2017. But they, they saw that there is, is no thing, just if you have T4 or a perforated colon cancer, you should not do adjuvant high pack on a, a basis uh, uh, routinely. That's not necessary. But on the other hand, they say, and they have a nice other study, they are just running now. If they resect the primary tumor and it's a T4 and they have no signs of peritoneal metastasis, they make a CT scan after six months. And then if, if there are no peritoneal signs, they make a second look within one month after the CT and then a second one after 18 months if a CT scan does not show any signs of peritoneal metastasis. And I think this, this protocol makes quite sense uh, to be aware that these patients are on a very high risk to develop uh, peritoneal carcinosis uh, in which a way ever you operate on them, but it really makes sense to look after them closely. And I like that, that trial very, very much. It's the Colopec 2 trial. We will see what will be the outcome. So laparoscopy, we can say is the last diagnostic and the first therapeutic tool in T4 colon cancer. It's definitive advanced colorectal surgery. You should be aware of unexpected situations and you should consider the conversion early to make an unblock resection and you really should focus on R0. Otherwise, it makes no sense to do major surgery if you're not able to perform an R0 resection. And please use retrieval bags for all those even they are larger if you do laparoscopy, uh, because maybe even if you use a protection foil, you will squeeze the specimen 
via a narrow hole and then you, you squeeze maybe tumor cells intra-abdominal and, and distribute them, what, what we do not want. Um, consider, of course, for those patients who had then in the, in the end a T4 tumor, a second look or high pack, maybe do this, this protocol already shown in the Colopec 2 trial. Nevertheless, take this message. We want to, don't want to harm the patient. So if you decide for open or laparoscopy, the decision to do that is more important than the size of the incision. Thanks a lot. Finally, I ask Michael now to present uh, his case on uh, colon cancer, T4 lymphadenectomy. Michael, please, your presentation. Uh, my task is to present the case. So I will just focus on the procedure. Uh, but before I start with the <clears throat> laparoscopy, I would like to, uh, to, to focus you on one very important thing. Uh, first, just this, the, the brief description of the case. It's a 50-year-old male patient, uh, not very obese, uh, with an obstructing sigmoid carcinoma, no distant metastasis. But uh, in CT, the sigmoid tumor was infiltrating the urinary bladder and the small bowel. Additionally, an aortic aneurysm, uh, just in case uh, we were, uh, you will see it in the, in the movie. Uh, first thing, we, in these cases, we never uh, promise the patient that it will end up laparoscopically. So the patient is scheduled for, for exploration and perhaps laparoscopic resection. So we tell the patient that the risk of conversion is, is relatively high if we, uh, if we have a T4 cases. Uh, another very important thing is CT. Uh, you can see in this CT, that's the, the uh, aneurysm. And uh, if you look now, you see that there is something going on in the pelvis. Uh, and of course, uh, it's very important to discuss the, the, the CT with the radiologist. Uh, I think that uh, although I trust them very much, I think that it's very, very useful to look more carefully at CT before you do a T4 uh, case, uh, because there are some very important de details that can, um, that can tell you uh, what doesn't have to be important for the ra radiologist. Um, all right, this is my typical trocars placement for a uh, left-sided resection. However, in more difficult cases, I add two additional trocars. Uh, this uh, in the right epigastrium is usually for uh, splenic flexion mobilization, and this in the uh, left hypogastrium is, uh, you will see why, why it is necessary. It's very useful for rectal cancers, but uh, it was also necessary for, for this case. And now we have the case. You can see a tumor. The tumor is involving the small bowel. You can see it here. And it's also involving the, the appendix. At least there is some small adhesion. So we, we decided to remove the appendix. And uh, this is why CT is important. So uh, we want to be sure that the tumor is uh, resectable. Yeah. So we start from doing uh, irreversible steps like transecting the small bowel. Uh, we just don't want to touch the tumor. Uh, so we are trying to get rid of the organs that won't be resected and leave just the tumor. Uh, this will be a small uh, resection. Uh, you, of course, with the stapler and uh, the small bowel anastomosis will be done later uh, extracorporeally. Uh, after specimen removal uh, via mini laparotomy. So, uh, yeah. We are stapling the bowel just to save one load of the uh, stapler. We, we are using the longer stapler and transect two loops of the bowel. Uh, of course, it doesn't have to be uh, it doesn't have to involve the small bowel mesentery like in small bowel cancer. And here you can see that the mesentery is very, very short. Uh, it is infiltrated. So I decided to do it the other way around. That's the part uh, of the infiltration of the urinary bladder. It turned out it's, it's relatively big infiltration, at least adhesion. Uh, so uh, I tried to 
keep the margin. Uh, I open the peritoneum very wide and move uh, step by step. And here comes the first problem, uh, straight instruments, and you can't get behind the tumor. The tumor is very big, so you can't get behind. And this is why we use the additional trocar. I'm quite liberal in using five millimeter ports. I think it's just for the, um, the surgeon's convenience. So uh, when necessary, I, I just insert one or two extra trocars and I'm opening the retroperitoneum. Of course, here it's not the proper uh, plane. Here's the proper plane. I'm trying to get to the tumor from the lateral side. I'm opening very wide the, la uh, the, the lateral aspect of the uh, descending colon of the sigmoid colon. Uh, I prefer using a hook in this uh, in this case. I I just like it. Of course, you can use whatever you you like, but but doesn't really matter. Uh, however, it's good to keep the proper plane uh, and opening. Uh, the the uh, told fascia very widely uh, helps. I start from the place where there is no infiltration, and I move I move to the most crucial part. Here I'm deep in the retroperitoneum. Uh, of course, uh, we didn't have any confirmed infiltration to the retroperitoneum, but I just want to keep the margin. And now I'm, of course, looking for the ureter, which is a crucial organ uh, in this case. Anything can be resected. In fact, even the ureter can be resected, but uh, it's good to know that you have to or you have uh, transected the ureter. So I put the ureter on the loop. I'm quite obs obsessive about the ureters because, well, it happened to me to damage the ureters uh, <laughs> once or twice. So now I'm, I'm quite obsessive about them. And I'm trying to get rid of the ureter. We didn't have any, any collision with the ureter. So I'm pretty sure that it's just a matter of mm, delicate dissection. Uh, and so it continues uh, like this. That's the vast difference on the left side. Uh, so you can see that the uh, anterior aspect of the retroperitoneum is, is also open, uh, but uh, this is how we are trying to get to the urinary bladder. And now I am trying to get rid of the tumor from the urinary bladder. I'm, I, I already agreed and the patient agreed to have the resection of the partial resection of the bladder. So, so I don't mind opening the bladder. I think that it's better to open the bladder than to do non-radical resection. Yeah. So, uh, and here I also use a hook. Uh, however, to transect the muscles, ligature can be perhaps more convenient because it seals the vessels uh, the the muscles are are quite bloody can bleed so so ligature is also quite good uh, so we as you can see i'm trying to do it layer by layer not just to make a hole in the bladder and then think what to do next uh, instead i'm trying to cut the peritoneum, then, this, then the fat. And yeah, here is the bladder open. Uh, this had to happen, so no worries. Uh, yeah, this is, an, it's not an infiltration. It's just a inflammatory reaction as it turned out. Uh, so no worries, but anyway, I'm trying to get rid out of this uh, unhealthy uh, bladder wall and just the part to be resected. Uh, the patient was lucky because it was just an infiltration in the, uh, it didn't infiltrate too much to, of the retroperitoneum. So it was quite easy to be honest, to, to resect it. Uh, and here, as I told you, layer by layer, it's probably the safest way how you can uh, not damage uh, too much. 
And as you can see, the bladder wall and the surrounding tissues are quite thick. So uh, one has to be very, very ag aggressive to, to uh, damage the bladder. And thus difference, it was involved somehow. So we decided the patient is 58, didn't complain about this type of uh, resection. And we have freed the tumor, and now we are uh, continue with the, let's call it typical sigmoidectomy. I'm opening the mesentery, medial to lateral. Of course, uh, one has to be very careful about the nerves. Uh, I'm pretty sure the nerves were, were injured on the left side, so at least here I'm trying to preserve the nerves and the right side uh, of the nerves because uh, this is extremely important for a patient, especially for a patient with smaller bladder than preoperatively. Here, I also prefer to use a hook. Uh, it is quite convenient. I, I lower the coagulation a little bit uh, so that it, the, the, the hook is more delicate, more, more precise. And yeah, we continue until we reach the vascular pedicle and this is the, the aneurysm. Uh, it's good to know this preoperatively because otherwise I would think that perhaps these are enlarged lymph nodes and I don't want to know what would happen if uh, if I tried to di dissect this, uh, this, <laughs> this thing. Uh, so I'm getting to the inferior mesenteric artery which will also be, uh, we dissected, uh, yeah, step by step. In this case, ligature is very useful. This area is quite bloody usually. Uh, and yeah, interestingly, uh, the tumor turned out not to be T4. Uh, instead, there was a big uh, abscess involving the bladder and involving the small bowel. But of course, we didn't know that before. So we treated the patient like it was a real T4 case. Uh, but for a patient, probably uh, better news than real T4. Uh, it was, of course, our zero resection. And the next part is just the transecting of the of the of the of the mesentery. Uh, I sometimes I try to keep the marginal artery and transect the mesentery uh, extra corporeally uh, with the scissors to see if it's if it bleeds. If you have ICG. This is also an option. And of course, in this case, splenic flexure mobilization was necessary. This is the part of the splenic flexure mobilization. Uh, in this case, it was uh, lateral to medial. However, I must admit, I prefer medial to lateral approach, uh, but yeah, most of the job was done from the lateral aspect. So. I thought that why not to, to do it from the lateral side. And uh, to continue, it's not nothing new uh, with the, uh, yeah, that's, this, that's the inferior mesenteric vein. We go on. Uh, yep, and farther, farther. And transecting the bowel. Uh, it is like in a uh, usual case, nothing unusual. Uh, yeah, and 60 millimeter uh, stapler is very good for, for the sigmoid because in all cases, one, in, one, uh, one load is enough. In the rectum, it is never uh, convenient because of the narrow pelvis and that's the finished mm, uh, resection. You see the open bladder, uh, the last steps of the splenic flexure mobilization, uh, opened uh, mental bursa, and yeah, that's the the last last bites of the of the mobilization. I I tend to do the splenic flexure mobilization almost. Uh, always. And now 
uh, we are mobilizing the bladder because it has to be sutures somehow. So uh, the, the mobilization of the bladders, uh, bladder allows uh, less tension and uh, a wonderful stitch. I mean, the V-lock, which is great for, uh, for, uh, for this job uh, and suturing of the, of the bladder. Uh, one layer, uh, I mean, all layers, uh, single stitch, running stitch. Uh, it is a bit uh, demanding, I would say, because the, the angles and um, they are difficult, but it just requires some practice. Uh, we are not doing a lot of bladder suturing. Uh, therefore, it took us some time until we uh, get to know how to uh, to do it uh, good. Uh, a little bit from above, a little bit from below. Uh, I think it's it's more convenient, especially that these angles are often difficult to, to close either on the bottom or on the top. And so it continues. Uh, of course, when you already close the bladder, it has to be checked uh, leak test. Uh, yeah, it is okay. We keep the urinary bladder longer. Uh, this is obvious, of course, and tension has to be low and the anastomosis at the end. Of course, small bowel anastomosis was done uh, after specimen was extracted uh, just for convenience. And this is all. Thank you very much. Now we have some questions. We have left uh, seven minutes and um, I see all the presenters are online. So let uh, me give a first question to Felix. There's one question in the chat uh, asking a D2, a D2 lymphadenectomy. Is this sufficient for um, suspected small cancer? Yeah, very good question. Um, if you trust your radiologist, which I do, yes, but there is a, some kind of uh, understaging in our CT scans. So uh, who can, who can uh, really predict that it's really a T2 cancer, uh, a, a small a T, T, T2 cancer? Um, so I would prefer a D3 dissection in any stage, which uh, has been... Uh, proposed and confirmed by the large series of publication from the Dan Danish group around uh, um, uh, Pertelsen and co-workers. And what we learned from TME is following the uh, reversed embryological pathway is much more easier in uh, oncologically radical surgery than the other way around. So I would prefer D3 uh, lymph node um, retrieval by following the principles of CME in any case of uh, colonic. So thank you. This leads me to another question, which was delivered. D3 lymphadenectomy in all cases on the right side? Yes. Definitely. OK. Um, another question, which might be answered by Felix or by Walter. Photo documentation of the specimen, including the measurements in all cases? We, we do photo documentation, the pathologists do, and we, we measure it immediate uh, after, after taking out the specimen. And I also agree with the D3, it's easier to do it in every case and, and not switch from D2 to D3. Yeah, we do a uh, uh, photo documentation of all the specimens in the OR because uh, it's not fixed. It is... Uh, so... What the standardization study um, of the German group um, is going to propose is that there, um, there should be a confirmation by the pathologist, uh, but we have to rate our own uh, specimens. Um, I do not think that there is a bias because there is a clear anatomical uh, description of the specimen with the surgical trunk, uh, with the fascia being shiny on top, so uh, this can be uh, reviewed by a, a, a pretty normal uh, photograph at all. So I think this should be uh, documented and uh, stored with the patient's data. Okay, thank you. There is another question, short question, which might be short answered. 
is CME also um, beneficial in rectal cancer? Yes, but it's termed TME. <laughs> yes, that's the correct answer. Um, uh, but it's the same embryological approach. So I, th I think this is important, reversed embryology in uh, colorectal cancer at all. So, um, okay. Another question um, for maybe Felix or Walter. Um, there is a question if CME is not the same as D3 lymphadenectomy or is it the same? And there's a, a second question appeared, nearly the same question uh, asking, if CME is the same like extended lymphadenectomy or not. So the same questions. Go, um, go, to, the, go to the next uh, cafe and ask for a cappuccino without milk. Good. Um, one question to, to Walter. Um, the, there was one uh, question. If the, you showed some slides on, on, on guidelines, and there's one question concerning the EAS guideline for Europe. There's an old guideline which says no T4 cancer. Uh, the, the, the question is if there's a new guideline in Europe. I think you well, should. Actually, the, the recommendation is similar as it was before, but the newer data will come. But there are no randomized control styles for the moment, so we cannot prove. But first, the recommendation was you should not do it, but it's only a recommendation. And we see people are publicating. OK. Then I. I I would personally ask one question. Um, Felix, you have had your slides that the frequency of the small bowel movement after extended lymphadenectomy will be more. And the uh, last uh, webinar, we had a wonderful lecture by Bemelmann um, stating that with this radical lymphadenectomy, there will be um, more paralysis uh, at the initial phase. Could you comment on that? Yeah, that's interesting. I, I would rather share uh, Willem's uh, um, um, outline because uh, so the one study is uh, um, there is a the differentiation in this study I mentioned between T2, T2 and T3 uh, lymphadenectomy. So um, I think there is not a clear differentiation. I'm sure that if we do a radical uh, root dissection of the lymph nodes there, we harm the superior uh, uh, mesenteric uh, plexus. And, uh, but it's not only the, the damage to the nerves, uh, but uh, the, uh, the, the anastomotic uh, design at all. So we all know that uh, an ileotransverse ostomy um, is either you do it manually or, or, or uh, uh, stapled uh, intracorporally or extracorporally. This, this is an anatomical disruption. And I think this is also one of the parts why the small bowel is not uh, functioning uh, um, uh, at, at, at once. But I, I totally share Willem's uh, uh, okay. outline. So okay. there are some functional problems at all. Uh, there's two more questions, one for Walter, one for Michael. Walter, um, in a T4 cancer, lateral abdominal wall, um, is it necessary to make a frozen section from the re residual area or not? Well, the frozen section um, gives you only uh, a good advice if it's positive. If it's negative, you have to wait for the, for the complete. So maybe it's easier to wait for the complete. If you just mark one position, then it makes sense. But that's always in frozen section. If you have a larger field of a surface, if you can mark one position you're interested, then it makes sense, but not for the whole. OK. And uh, there's one question for Michael. What was the, um, uh, the hook, the electric hook? How much um, energy was uh, the setup? Uh to be honest, I don't know, um, but it was just a regular setup we use for cholecystectomy for, for anything. It's just the, the scrub nurses, they, they set, set it up. If it's too, too high, we, we ask them to lower it down, but I can't tell the exact the values. I don't know, but it was just a normal. Yeah. Okay, so now actually... There... In terms, in terms of, of hook, the more important thing that the, the energy is the tension. If you give enough tension to the tissues, it will cut as hell. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, to answer this question, I would recommend the divorce course. 
there are always a lecture on energy devices and the right use of energy. So next uh, autumn, um, Walter showed this slide, there is another interesting course. Just recently, there's a new question for sigmoid colectomy. Do you take down the inferior mesenteric vein? Walter, please. Yeah, but because of the length, the question is where do you cut it? If you have to go very central, it's not necessary oncological, but sometimes for the length. Mm -hmm. And in sigmoid, it's not necessary to cut it quite at the border of the pancreas. Okay. The vein is not for the oncology reason, but for the length of the specimen to get down. And this is, for example, for the TME, this is necessary because otherwise you would not come down. Okay, final question from Austria. Um, do you use pelvin intraoperative neuromonitoring in T4 resections mandatory? Short answer, please. We are running out of time. Well, Andreas, I can, I can take over if you have to go. We, we decided that in, in between because I saw some others. So, so if you have to leave, it's possible uh, for the answer. At, we will have on, on regular cancer, we will have uh, several topics. So maybe we can cover that there. But I think nobody does uh, intraoperative neuromonitoring in, in all the cases. There are some few publications coming up now. And the question is how, how much the difference is. But Felix, maybe you can answer also. It, it's not uh, covering all the areas uh, of colorectal um, centers. So I followed the data by uh, Werner Kneist in Mainz, now in Eisenach, and he has done Heraldus an outstanding work on uh, uh, research of pelvic uh, neuromonitoring monitoring in the last 10 to 15 years. And he showed quite good um, uh, results uh, in preserving uh, um, autonomic nerve fibers. Uh, with the therapeutic consequence, question mark, what do you do if you have... Uh, a weak signal? Do you uh, leave your suprapubic uh, catheter or do you change your oncologic strategy? Question mark. I'm not that sure, but I think it's uh, uh, worth discussing this in the rectal sessions. Absolutely. Okay. Maybe Andreas, if you have to, to skip, I, I will take over because I see there are some, some others. Is that okay for you, Andreas? Yes. Okay. Thank yes. you. Thank you all. And uh, continue the final questions on chemotherapy, um, I will be back. Okay, thanks. So I see there is the question uh, about T4 tumors, if you should go for surgery or for neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And actually there is only only very few. We, we are not talking about rectal cancer. In rectal cancer, it seems it's, it's pretty clear to do neoadjuvant radiochemotherapy in colon cancer. Uh, there, there is just very few papers about doing a chemotherapy before the operation uh, or instead the operation. But, but for the moment, uh, it's, it's not an option if you have especially a stage two. So there are no lymph nodes, so we go for a resection. Um, and if there, because some, some end up in a T3 tumor in the end, and then you would give no adjuvant therapy at all. So for the moment, there, there are only a few uh, with new adjuvant strategies uh, before surgery uh, and the publications are, are very, very new. So Felix, do, what do you think about that new adjuvant therapy before resection of T4 colon cancer, not rectal cancer? Um, so actually I would call it induction uh, systemic treatment. Um, so we've uh, made interesting experience with uh, T4 tumors infiltrating the ureter and the bladder with uh, with a with a uh, with a good control of the of the tumor progress um, by doing this induction treatment. So this is not worth in obstructing tumors uh, after all. So um, then I would rather head for a, um, a primary resection. But uh, I think. Uh, uh, it's 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 based uh, on the individual state of the patient, and this should be clearly outlined in the MDT. Um, but I would I would do this, yeah. But if the patient tolerates an intensive uh, uh, approach uh, with with uh, with uh, with a uh, with an uh, intensified um, induction treatment. This is especially true if you have, uh, for example, liver meds, then, then uh, most go for liver first, and you have the chemotherapy, then you have the liver resection, then you have the chemotherapy, and then you go for the tumor if there is no obstruction. But in the T4, N0, so in the stage two, normally there, there is no chemo before, uh, especially if you're able to resect the tumor 
with the infiltrated organ. So maybe there is one one thing from Michael. As I saw, the I, I touched the bladder a little bit, uh, just in case you, you can do that. Of course, to resect the bladder partially. What we recommend is then to to put catheters in the in the ureters on both sides, uh, especially for suturing the the bladder in the end. And the question stays: You opened up the bladder right quite early before you did the, the vessels. And and I think there there are two strategies. We mainly go for first cutting the vessels if possible, and leave the tumor side with the attached organ for for the end and not for the beginning. So I think you you did it the other way around when I saw it. Well, uh, regarding stenting the 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 ureters, we do it not routinely. We don't do it routinely if there is any. Uh, suggestion that, uh, that there may be some interference with the uh, with the ureters, then we 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 stand the uh, ureter. But in this case, the, everything was clear. Everything was in the in the abdomen, not in the retroperitoneum. This is why we didn't uh, stand the ureter. But I think it's it can help. It doesn't have to be routine, but it can help. Uh, however, it doesn't prevent from from damaging the ureter according to some studies so uh, this is very difficult and in terms of this uh, 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 touching the, the bladder I think I had to, to, to do something uh, with the bladder because I didn't want to damage the mesentery the, the, the mesentery was very very shortened and uh, I thought that uh, uh, when I get rid of the tumor, uh, I will be able to get better access to the to the vessels. And uh, there was no uh, problems with the uh, with the vessels in CT. So this is why I suggest talking to your radiologist and ask about very important uh, things for a surgeon, not for the for the radiology, because he will tell you there are lymph nodes or there are no lymph nodes, but you can ask for for more precise uh, information. Okay, I think we come to the end. So thanks a lot, and please let me point out that there uh, is uh, we're great lectures. Thanks, Felix. Thanks, Michael, uh, for your co-work. Uh, and you can also look up the former webinars. Uh, there is on YouTube channel. You can you can have the link, and uh, you will be informed about that. Thanks to Metronic for organizing. Thanks for all the lecturers. Thanks a lot and have a nice evening. Mm -hmm.